Hello, I am Henry of Cardiff, and I am here with Sybil of Cardiff. We are the Cardiff University Medieval Reenactment Society. Today we're going to be showing you a few things about 12th century fashion for the lower classes. So right here I have with me a tenant farmer woman. What she's generally doing most of her days is she is farming along with all the men in the field. Um, both men and women are expected to be farmers and tend their land, but also, additionally, she might be doing some embroidery and some weaving on the side. So to show you what she's wearing, we're going to work our way up. Everything she's wearing is made of um, materials you can get from uh, nature or um, things that you can grow and harvest. So starting at the bottom, we have, she has some leather turn shoes here, which are made of leather, uh, typically from a cow, and that have been laced up. Um, above that, she is wearing stockings, which can be made of either linen or wool. Hers are made of linen. They are tied above the knee, as well as they have a leather, a thin leather band that's being used as a garter to help keep them up. Above that, she is wearing an underdress, a sort of dress underneath her dress, which is also made of linen, which is typically more comfortable than wool. Above that, she's wearing her outer dress, which is made of wool. You can see it's been dyed um, a bit red, probably using a matter dye of some sort. And she is keeping that cinched tight to her body using a leather belt, a plain leather belt like what I'm wearing here as well, which typically has a brass or iron um, buckle. To keep herself warm from the elements and keep the rain and wind off of her, she is wearing a cloak, uh, which she has also embroidered with some yellow thread and she has probably used some woad dye to dye the blue. She has lined the cloak with linen on the inside, which is just a natural linen color as it comes off the plant. On her head, she is wearing a wimple. This is a wimple that almost is almost universal across 12th century society in Britain um, in order for both modesty and to protect themselves from de the devil whispering in their ears. Women are wearing wimples to cover their ears most specifically, but also often their hair for modesty. Uh, we can also tell this woman is quite pious as well. She's wearing a cross made of wood suspended on some leather thonging. Now I'm here with Arthur of Cardiff, who's going to be showing some lower class male kit. Uh, Arthur here is also a tenant farmer, a peasant, so he is also expecting to spend most of his time working in the fields, um, harvesting, planting, all the things that come along with that. He may also be doing various other trades around the house, maybe doing a cottage industry as well, maybe doing a little bit of woodworking, um, but primarily his profession, his job is farmer. He also will be expected to provide 40 days military service to his liege lord, a knight or baron or whoever owns the land he works on. So starting with um, the bottom here, he is wearing hose, which is very similar garment to the stockings that extend much farther up his legs. They are also much tighter because they are made of wool exclusively. The wool can actually stretch over the leg, um, which makes it much tighter. And this is part of the fashion of the 12th century. It was fashionable to have clothes as tight as possible uh, because it helps to show off your, your lovely limbs while keeping you covered up. So um, these are essentially pant legs with feet built into them, these hose and he has tied them off to what is essentially a pair of shorts or underwear known as braids, um, which he has tied with leather thonging. He could also use some wool yarn or similar material to tie off his hose. Now, above that, he is wearing a tunic and an under tunic. These are very similar to the dress and underdress, except they are shorter, but still very, very tight on the arms and still is tight on the chest and torso. Um, so on the underdress, under tunic, rather. You can see it's made of linen as well, natural linen as it comes from the plant, and the outer tunic is also made of wool. He has dyed this with a blue woad dye, and he has also has embroidery on the bottom edge here, just a straight line with orange thread. So uh, also he has a very similar plain leather belt that he's using to keep this tunic cinched to him. Also the belt is a very useful thing to have. Uh, as especially as someone working in the fields, you can suspend your tools on it if you want to hang an axe or perhaps a knife of some description off your belt. It's very useful. You can also have pouches for various things, combs, uh, sieves, whatever you might want to be carrying with you. 
Now, on Arthur's head here, we have a hood. This is a classic working man's um, garment here. This protects him from the sun, um, you know, tanning the back of his neck, as well as it protects him from the rain and the cold and the wind. Uh, underneath that hood, he is also wearing a coif, something similar to what I'm also wearing here. That's made of linen, and that's just another layer. It is another universal garment of the 12th century people, all the way from barons and kings wear coifs down to the lowliest peasant, worn typically on their own or with other hats and caps. I am also wearing another type of cap known as a Phrygian cap, which is popular also throughout all social classes of the 12th century, though higher social classes might have ones made of uh, much uh, finer material and of dyed in a much brighter color. So thank you very much, Arthur, for showing off your fashion. Now we're going to be showing you what a typical medieval uh, soldier of the 12th century might wear. So right now you can see I am in my underwear. I am in my under tunic, as well as my hose, braise, and I'm wearing my boots to keep, uh, keep myself free of the mud while on campaign. I'll be representing a professional soldier, someone who fights for a living. So they will have, compared to your average peasant who is obligated to do 40 days of military service, a soldier will, a professional soldier will have much more equipment, though nothing that compares to the knight, which is going to have the most expensive, most up-to-date equipment. The first layer of actual armor that I will wear is the gambeson. The gambeson is essentially a padded jacket or coat using typically horse hair as padding between two layers of linen. This padding can help protect the wearer from attacks and it is an essential piece of armor when worn with the with mail. What this will do is protect me from bludgeoning, bludgeoning blows because of the thick padding will keep my, hopefully, keep my bones from breaking and other nasty bits. It is fastened at the neck with leather thonging to keep it secure and protect my throat. Next piece of armor I wear is an arming cap. This is a very similar piece of armor. It's made of similar padding, um, typically with horse hair beneath, between two layers of linen or wool. This I will put on my head to also similarly protect my head from bludgeoning blows and hopefully keep my skull intact. It very much resembles a rugby helmet or similar sporting equipment. Now, so far, I'm just wearing fabric, cloth. This isn't particularly expensive, but now we have probably the most expensive piece of armor, the mail. Uh, sometimes known as chain mail in popular culture, thanks to Gary Gygax and Dungeons and Dragons. This is made of many thousands of interlocking links, which will protect me. Mail is always worn over padding of some description, as it provides little protective value on its own. However, when combined with padding, such as this gambeson, it can be extremely effective at protecting the wearer. The mail is extremely time-consuming to make, and therefore would be expensive. The pattern of this mail is called 4-in-1, which is one of the most popular patterns of mail across the world. Each link is connected to four other links. Now, this piece of armor can be quite heavy. So in order to keep it suspended and put some of the weight on my hips, not just on my shoulders, I also wear a belt. Now, this belt is distinct from a lot of some of the peasanty belts that you have seen. This belt is extremely long. In order to show off their wealth, um, typically in the Middle Ages, instead of having a wider belt, you would have a longer belt to show off just how much extra useless leather you could afford to have. Now that I have the armor suspended on my belt, I'm actually quite agile on this, and I don't really feel the weight nearly so much. Next piece of armor I will wear is to protect the most important part of my body, a helmet. Now, a helmet of this type is very much universal in the 12th century. A nasal helmet 
You even see these back on the Bayo Tapestry. So you'll see peasants wearing these. You will see knights. You will see lords. You may even see kings wearing helmets like this. A very functional, very good design. It is, this one in particular, is made of one piece of iron, which is protecting my head, as well as a nasal extending downwards to protect my nose and a bit of my face. So slashes coming at my face will ideally be deflected by either the nasal or the head itself. I'm quite well armored. I'm quite well protected, but, well, I can't really do much fighting without weapons. First weapon I will have is a long knife. This is a weapon that you might see peasants have, except my version is a little different. This one has a blade on both sides. A peasant will typically carry a tool knife, something that they could use on the fields as well as for war. Whereas for me, this knife exists purely for war. A tool knife with two edges on it is not very useful for, you know, doing tool work because you want to be able to touch the back of it. However, a double-edged knife is quite useful for war. This, I, ha I carry in a leather sheath, also tied to my belt. Similarly to the peasant, I do also carry the tools of my profession suspended from a belt. Now, the knife is not my main weapon. One of my other main weapons, one of my more main weapons is a mace. As a professional soldier, I expect to also be fighting other professional soldiers, other well-armed soldiers. So I may carry something like this, a mace, which will allow me to break through their armor and hopefully carry the day. Now, I don't have one of these to show you, but my main weapon would be a spear. A pole arm is kind of the main weapon of any soldier, whether you are a peasant or even a knight or nobleman. So there I am, armed and armored. I'm also gonna take a pair of gloves to keep my hands protected. Put a little bit of padding in them. This leaves the main, most important piece of protective equipment, the shield. Every soldier on a 12th century battlefield would be seen with a shield. Um, the shield will be rimmed in leather, uh, faced with canvas and painted with a distinctive heraldry, usually chosen by the lord in which uh, the soldier is in service to. Typically, I may be a mercenary soldier either in the service of some sort of free company, or I may be in the service in the retinue of a particular lord or knight whose uh, heraldry I carry. With these weapons, I'm well armored, and I'm also still quite agile. I can run. I can jump, I can do push up. Oh. If armor is slow and restricts my movement, then it's no good to me because if I can't move, if I can't fight, then I'm just as dead as if, as if I was wearing no armor at all. This armor in particular is particularly potent against slashing weapons. A slashing weapon can be quite easily deflected by the mail and the blow, most of it will be take most of the force will be taken out of it by the padding of the gamison underneath. Piercing with a thrusting weapon can also be um, softened. <clears throat> a thrusting blow can also be softened, but a good thrust from a spear or an arrow can pierce the mail and penetrate through the gambeson a little bit. Uh, but oftentimes the gamuts will be enough to slow down that blow to keep me alive. However, what this armor is most vulnerable to is bludgeoning weapons like this mace. The force of this doesn't depend on slashing through or stabbing through. This is just transferring pure kinetic energy into someone's body. This can break bones through mail and rupture internal organs if it lands on my gut. So this is what your typical medieval soldier might look like. I think we might want to see it in action. 